Hello everyone, and welcome to my guide for fighting Arch-Tempered Kulvtaroth. My goal is for you to be able to farm Kulvtaroth quickly and without dying. In order to do that, you will want to watch this guide from the beginning to the end. Don't forget you can increase the play speed of the video, and I'll also include a table of contents of some sort in order for you to be able to skip around if you want to. You should also consider joining my Discord server so you can meet up with other players who want to farm Kulv Taroth. We have about 5,000 members, and they're very active, and they're pretty well informed as well. The Kulv Taroth Siege has been out for a while, both on the PC and on the console. Of course, the Arch Tempered version is only on the console as of this video. So I'm going to go ahead and assume a few things about you. For example, you should already have the Siege mode unlocked. You should know that the Kulv Taroth Siege is a rotating event that isn't always available. You should know that you're wasting your time if you aren't in a session of 16 players. You should also know that the siege has to be started from the gathering hub. And finally, you should already know that the goal of the siege is to break Kulv Tarot's horns off. The goal of this video is to help you learn to break your horns off quickly and efficiently, even if you're only hunter rank 16. Similar to what I did with my behemoth guide, we're going to start this off by taking a look at a flowchart of the Kulv Tarot siege. Outside of the fight is something I call the pre-fight. This is where you should know about your reward level, you should know about your pursuit level, because this tells you what you're trying to accomplish each time you start your next run. So let's say you haven't broken Kulv Tarot's tail yet. That means you're going to be thinking about breaking her tail in the next run in order to maximize your reward level. The pre-fight also includes this checklist. Make sure you have the correct loadout. Sometimes fighting Kulv Tarot means using different loadouts. This also assumes you have a good loadout, which we can discuss later. Uh, two, make sure you've refreshed your items. Fighting Kulv Tarot can involve using different ammo types, and it's also going to include using barrel bombs. So you want to make sure you always have those reloaded before you leave. And finally, don't forget to eat an appropriate meal. In fact, with 16 people in the session, there's a pretty good chance someone used a meal voucher, which essentially allows you to build whichever feline food skill you want. If you don't know how to work on feline food skills, well, maybe I need to make a video on that because that's a pretty basic skill. Everyone should know how to do that. So there's a total of four stages that you fight Kulv Taroth in, and Next on the diagram, we're going to be working with stage 1. The question you have to ask yourself is, is Kulv Taroth at pursuit level 1, 2, and 3? If she is, that's considered kind of like a lower pursuit level. Then your strategies for stage 1 of the fight are going to be very different because she's at a low pursuit level. Your goal isn't to break her horns, your goal is simply to collect her tracks and her shattered gold. You can actually break one or two pieces of her tail, and then after about 8 to 12 minutes, she just retreats and the run is over. It's considered complete, right? You didn't break her horns, but it's over. And then you go back to the hub and you find out that your pursuit level went up by a significant amount because every time you break a piece of her mantle, uh, as well as when you collect her tracks or collect her gold, uh, that raises your pursuit level. So in this case, this is just a farming run where you're intentionally raising the pursuit level as efficiently as you can. Now let's say that Kulv Taroth is actually at pursuit level 4, 5, or 6. Those are the upper pursuit levels. Now you want to try and do a full run, an attack run, where you actually try to break her horns, which means bringing her through the entire fight. Okay, so in stage 1, you should actually, at that point, be optimizing your damage output against her. This means dropping the boulders, using the cannons, using your barrel bombs. When Kulv Taroth takes enough damage in stage 1, she's going to get mad and she's going to run off to stage 2. During stage 2, any part of her body that you haven't broken at least once needs to be prioritized until in your mind you can do kind of a checklist where you've broken all of her individual parts. If she does not shed in stage 2, you're going to have a little more work to do as she moves into stage 3. Stage 3 of the Kulv Taroth fight is your last chance to get her to shed, and Capcom has kind of given you some tools in order to do this. When you run down there, you'll notice that there's three hanging boulders, one to your right, two to the back of the room, and these deal a tremendous amount of damage. Not only do they damage her though, they also knock her over. So what you're able to do is gang up on any part of her body that you haven't broken once. You can also use it to chip her horns, and finally you can use it to just you know, shred through her mantle, and this will cause her to shed pretty quickly. So stage three is very important that everyone cooperates on getting those boulders to drop right on top of her. If you're not contributing to this, then you're really causing your team to really be held back in this stage. It's your priority and responsibility to get all three of those boulders on top of her. 
Now there's another part to stage 3. If Kulf Taroth has shed and she's moved on to stage 4, you may need to stop and swap over to your stage 4 build. Don't forget there were free farcasters in the community chest, and this makes it pretty cheap and easy to just use that free farcaster to go back. So hop back to the tent, refresh your items, grab your stage 4 build, and rejoin the fight using the big slide. Alright, and finally you've reached stage 4 of the Kulf Taroth fight. Your primary goal is to break her horns. However, if you want to maximize your rainbow rewards, you're going to have to break her tail as well. Now, that's not true if you had just done a run and broken her tail at that point, but if you have not broken her tail up to this point, up to this reward cycle, if you want to think of it that way, reward cycle, if you haven't broken her tail yet, you're going to want to break her tail. That's going to trigger two more rainbow rewards. It's going to bring you all the way up to six. Really important here, okay? So you break her tail, uh, her tail takes damage from any source, and then you break her horns, and then the siege is over. And you can just start a new siege, right? New reward cycle, new siege. Now, if you fail to break her horns, and she actually retreats from stage 4, you could be in a lot of trouble because a different team might actually break her horns first. If they do that, they're going to trigger the rewards early, and you're not going to get very many rainbow rewards. In fact, you'll be lucky if you get two rainbow rewards, which is just terrible, considering all of the time you've invested. So yeah, it's really important that you don't mess stage 4 up. Alright, so now you have a visual idea of what the Kulv Taroth fight looks like. We're done looking at the diagram, why don't we go into the actual stages and kind of break them down into further detail well, using examples and, and you know, more in-depth tips, right? Let's run over to the harvest box, empty it out, fertilize whatever we're growing, and then we're going to open our world map and travel directly to the gathering hub. Remember, we'll be doing this in a session full of 16 people, and the reason we empty the harvest box is just because uh, you don't really want to travel back to the harvest bo box all the time, so having it be empty is going to allow it to fill back up. Once you've arrived at the gathering hub, you'll notice that the hub lass is the one who lets you start the Kulv Taroth siege. The siege starts at pursuit level 1, and your reward level will start at level 1 as well. By hitting the right bumper, you can look at the list of objectives and learn which ones are left to complete. Finishing this list will help max out your reward level pretty easily, so in between runs you can check this list and prioritize whatever is left to do. Other teams may get an objective done first, and then they're going to be sharing the points for finishing those objectives with you. This is why it's better to have 16 people in your session, because not just that, but the pursuit level is shared as well. So when someone else raises the pursuit level, everyone gets a higher pursuit level. In fact, one of the more complicated tricks with the pursuit level is to, uh, well, do your siege run, right? Do a run and then check the pursuit level. Let's say the pursuit level is only level two. And what you can do is you can you can talk to the hub lass and ask to join a quest. And what you can do is you can examine and see if anyone else is still doing a pursuit level one run. That means there's another team that hasn't completed their run. And what you do is instead of starting your next run against Kulv Taroth, you just wait for them to come back because when they come back, they're going to be contributing their pursuit points that they earned at stage one to the total pursuit level. So you just kind of wait there. Pursuit level is at pursuit level two. You wait for them to come back. And when they come back, they're probably going to boost it to pursuit level three or pursuit level four. At that point, you can go in and start your own run. Okay, so at this point, let's say I'm starting at pursuit level one, two, or three. Those are the lower pursuit levels. This means your strategy in stage one of the Kulv Taroth fight is basically to let her retreat from stage one. She has a timer, and if you don't do enough damage and you don't break enough of her parts, she retreats from the current stage that you're in, but you actually want that. The reason why is because after a significant testing, we discovered that allowing Kulv Taroth to end the fight herself at stage one, and you did nothing but gather tracks, that's the most efficient way to race the pursuit level. It's not the most fun way, but it is the most efficient way. You just follow right behind her. It's very safe, actually. You follow right behind her, gather tracks, and then she leaves in roughly eight minutes if you're at pursuit one. The other thing you can do, you can actually break two parts at the end of her tail, and she won't go to stage two. So you're allowed to do a little bit of damage, and when you break those parts, you're going to have a few more extra pursuit points. Just don't let that distract you from picking up the tracks and picking up the shattered gold, right? So there's really no special technique for doing this. It's pretty self-explanatory. It's also going to satisfy one of the Kulv Taroth objectives 
called Single Run Siege Complete. Basically, your team needs to start from Pursuit 1 and finish a run against Kovtaroth without wiping and without returning from the quest, right? Like if you choose to return from the quest, that's going to ruin the objective. Now, if you see others attacking Kovtaroth from Pursuit 1 or Pursuit 2, it's because they don't understand that this method of attacking Kovtaroth as if you were going for a serious run is very inefficient. And it also poses a much higher risk for a team wipeout before completing the single run siege objective. So attacking Kovtaroth from Pursuit 1 or 2 is efficient because her parts really don't break. She has really, really tough parts, and you have almost no chance of breaking her horns before she retreats in stage four. So really, you're just wasting a whole lot of time. You're putting yourself at high risk of getting wiped out by her, and you're doing all this at a low pursuit level, which is not what you want to be doing. It's important that everyone in your session kind of starts to learn this. So consider sharing this video if you want to help spread the word that it is considerably safer and more efficient to use track farming at low pursuit levels rather than trying to do a serious attack run at low pursuit levels. You can share this video. You can also try to talk with them in, in the chat, whatever chat you have. You can try to send them messages. You can send messages to everyone, right? Whatever you need to do to communicate to them, I'm hoping this video gets a decent number of views so that people are learning about it. It's my understanding that a lot of Asian players are already using this strategy and it's really it's the English speakers that don't understand it and I'm trying to fix that. I also want to point out that if you're on a skilled team of players, it is possible to go straight to the horn break from pursuit level 3, so you might move into attempting that right away, but if you're with randoms or new players, I would try to go for pursuit 4 or higher before going for the horn break, it just depends on how, how much you trust your team. Now let's say the pursuit level is 4, 5, or 6 then it is definitely time to go in for the horn break because just about everyone else is attempting this as well. And you wanna finish at about the same time as they do. You're going to treat stage one completely differently. Your new goal in stage one is to get Kovtaroth to shed her mantle. And you do this by breaking all of the parts of her golden mantle at least once. And then there's probably some damage thresholds. There might be some rules about how many times you have to break her parts in general, but I do know you need to break each of her parts at least once. So that means breaking her horn gold plating, both arms, both parts of her chest, and all four parts of her tail. If you've already broken a part of her golden mantle, you should move on to the next part of the mantle. One mistake a lot of players are making is to just randomly focus on whichever part of her body is closest. So she's going to dig, her mantle's going to come back, and then you just shoot whatever you want to. So I'm going to repeat again that your job is to break each different part of the mantle once. And this is the condition that you need in order to get her into stage 4 and enraged so that you get those rainbow rewards. Kovtaroth won't take much damage from your weapons in stage 1 of the fight because at the beginning of stage 1 she isn't glowing red yet, which you can make her glow red by simply dealing a lot of damage to her. Well, you can use the cannons for this, the boulders, and especially barrel bombs are the easiest way to get high damage on Kovtaroth, right? So barrel bombs, Kovtaroth takes bonus damage from barrel bombs, and that means it doesn't matter what weapon you're using, even the best weapons don't really compete with barrel bombs. If you have a lot of money and you have a lot of barrel bombs saved up, this is really where you should be using your barrel bombs, is this fight. So for stage one, you should consider the heavy artillery skill and the bombardier skill. Bombardier and barrel bombs are optimal damage output against Kovtaroth for the entire siege. And this means you want the Zora Gamma coil on basically all of your builds. You're also responsible for setting up your item loadout so you can craft as many Mega Barrel Bombs as possible. Don't forget that you can eat Feline Pyro, which will turn all of your large Barrel Bombs into Mega Barrel Bombs as you set them down. Eating Feline Pyro and then just setting down large Barrel Bombs is going to save you some of those Devil's Blights mushrooms, which you can then use for other activities. For newer players that can't afford a lot of Mega Barrel Bombs, I understand they're expensive, I strongly recommend getting good with the cannons then and throwing heavy artillery into your Stage 1 build. Don't forget that you're also able to eat the Feline Bombardier skill to further increase your cannon damage, which will bring the cannon damage up to roughly 600 damage per shot, just shy of 600. For all players in Stage 1, 
The trick is to learn the map quickly and to memorize Kulftirath's route pattern. This allows you to get optimal damage out on hers. It's not too hard actually to get optimal damage. She always spawns on the same route going the same direction. What's important to understand is that there's four holes in the map and she always goes through hole one or hole two first. If she doesn't do that route, then she goes through hole two and then through hole one first. See, so she just simply trades off of the same two holes. And if you know what those two holes are, you can just keep an eye on both of them, right? Whichever one she goes through, she's gonna show up outside of the other one. After she's done with the first two holes, she always moves into hole three. She never goes to hole four. She only goes to hole three, right? And then she emerges out of hole four. So it goes one and two, or she took the other route and it goes two and one, right? And then after she's done with those first two emergence holes, she runs off to emergence hole number three, disappears down into it, and then she emerges out of hole four, where there's a cannon staring straight at her. And you're gonna get a ton of damage with that cannon if you were able to understand her route. Okay, that was a lot. Let's review this section of the guide. Number one, I gave you my list of assumptions. Number two, I showed you my diagram of the fight. Number three, I showed you how to start the siege and how to look up objectives. Number four, you know the fastest, safest method for raising pursuit level from pursuit levels one, two, and three is to simply follow Kulv Tarath around and gather her tracks in gold and then let her retreat rather than pushing her into stage two. This is the most efficient method and is also the safest for completing one of the rainbow reward objectives. And then number five, you learned that by pursuit level four, five, and six, you should be changing your strategy to try and break her horns now. And this starts in stage one of the fight with you beginning the task of breaking each part of her mantle once. And not just randomly attacking her anywhere, but really focusing on whichever part of the mantle hasn't been broken at least once. Now that we're done with this part of the guide, it's time to talk about stages two, three, and four of the Kulv Tarath fight. In stage one, you dealt a ton of damage to Kulv Tarath by dropping every boulder she passed under, you operated the cannons using the feline food skill Bombardier, as well as the heavy artillery skill, and finally the last way you dealt big damage in stage one was by predicting which hole she was going to emerge out of and then setting up barrel bombs for very high damage. Now Kulv Tarath is mad as hell and she's running down to stage two of the fight. She's now going to fight you and you're going to want to know her entire moveset but I'm saving the review of her moveset for the end of the video. So don't forget to watch that part because understanding her moveset is very important for being effective against her. It's the same for every monster. When you understand the moveset, you need less defense because you're not gonna get hit. If you don't understand the moveset, you're probably gonna get hit. From now on in the fight, it's also your job to do as much damage as possible and break as many parts as you can as fast as you can. Kulf Taroth has arrived in stage two and she's turned around to face the players. You should already have a good memory for all the parts you've broken once so far and which ones you haven't broken. And you're going to rely on that memory because the first thing Kulf Taroth will do is roar and begin to dig underground to reset all of her parts. This hides the ones that need to be broken by making them look like they all need to be broken. After she emerges, you're going to have to remember which parts you haven't broken yet, and then prioritize them for damage. A lot of players like to set up bombs for when she comes out of the ground from her dig. This really isn't a bad idea to do around her head, since one of the things you can get done during stages two and three is you can chip her horns. The other thing you should know is that once her horns are chipped, you can't deal any more horn damage to her until she sheds her mantle. Also, you can tell when her horns are chipped by checking to see if there's some visible wear and tear on them. I want to mention something you shouldn't be doing in stages one, two, and three of the fight, and that's causing any of the ailments to Kulv Tarath. Do not do this. That's because you definitely want to save all of the ailments for stage four of the fight. And Kulv Tarath is very resistant to ailments after you've procced them once. So you only get one sleep, one paralysis, one mount, and typically one KO for the entire run, although realistically, if enough people are dealing KO, you could probably get two KOs. So this is especially relevant to certain weapons that are more likely to deal mount damage through their jump attacks. 
Here's the deal. It's okay to deal some mount damage. I would encourage that even. But you need to kind of learn how much you can do before actually mounting her. And then what you want to do is stop dealing mount damage and save it for stage 4. This is very important. As for regular ailments, you just don't want to be bringing any kind of sleep weapon or paralysis weapon that's going to cause an early proc on Kulv Taroth. So no sleep hammer, no sleep daggers, no paralysis insect glaive, right? Don't bring any of those. You should be using thunder weapons anyways. For some weapons, like the hammer or the dual blades, the big hill in the side of the room can be used to spam aerial attacks. There's also a few wedge beetles that can be used for aerial attacks as well if you have something like, I don't know, a greatsword. Alright, so let's say you've pushed Kulv Taroth into stage 3 without causing her to shed. This means you still have time to break any parts of her mantle that have never been broken once. On the way down to stage 3, you might consider drinking a cool drink since now you're going to be taking heat damage. Stage 3 is all about using the environment to deal more damage. This stage is especially important to newbie players because if you're knowledgeable about the room, you should be able to use the environment to make Kulv Taroth shed, as well as even chipping her horns. This is because the room has a lot of ways to use the environment for damage. Alternatively, a bad new player can waste a lot of time in this room by not properly luring Kulv Taroth around. There are three boulders, one of them is to the right after you enter the room, it sits right above a lava fissure, and there are crystal bursts nearby that can be used to drop it. Kulv Taroth will be waiting for you on the right side of the room just behind this boulder. So try to align yourself correctly. Uh, she's going to target you and she's going to move forward and she can end up moving right under the boulder and this is the easiest way to get the boulder to land on top of her. After the first boulder lands, you will have a nice window of time to deal damage wherever you want to. Remember that your goal is to finish breaking any parts of her mantle that have not been broken at least once. Afterwards, your final goal is to chip the horns. So around the time she is going to stand back up, you should already be sheathing your weapon and heading over to the back of the room for the two boulders that are right next to each other. Once again, there's another nearby lava fissure that can really pump out a lot of damage for you. So try to get her to stand right on top of that and right under the boulders. Once you've knocked down boulder number two, you get another window of time to deal a lot of damage to her. And here's the trick for boulder number three. Make sure that Kulv Taroth stands all the way back up before dropping it because what can happen is during her recovery frames, you know, she's recovering. If you drop the third boulder, it can actually, it'll, it'll deal damage to her, but it won't actually knock her down, and the knockdowns are very valuable. So you really do have to wait for her to completely stand back up before dropping the last boulder. Assuming you're doing enough damage and breaking enough of her parts, Kulv Taroth will shed her armor in stage 4, and then she's going to attempt to move to stage 3. Note that if there's still a hanging boulder on the ceiling and she's somewhat nearby it, go ahead and drop it as soon as you can, because she's going to roar and then she's going to run off. Well, if the boulder happens to clip her first, it's like free damage. It's a ton of free damage. You're all going to be able to gang up on her tail or her horns, whatever it is you're going to do. Alright, so let's say stage 3 is complete. We now need to talk about stage 4. When Kulv Taroth sheds her armor, her weaknesses change, and you no longer need the part breaker skill. So it's highly likely that you're going to have a stage 4 build for Kulv Taroth. If you don't, I'll be showing off high powered builds later on in the guide that you can choose from. Either way, you want to travel back to the camp for swapping your loadout. If you've gotten the aggro of the nearby Gajalakas, try using a Farcaster instead. Remember, the community chest has free Farcasters in it. If you don't need to swap equipment, go ahead and run down into the fight as soon as you can because Kulv Taroth's retreat timer has already started for stage 4, so you want to start getting damage out on her as soon as you can, even if you're waiting for your teammates to come back after, you know, they're off in the camp. Uh, but you want to start getting damage on her because you, what you don't want, you don't want to lose stage 4 by running out of time. That's very frustrating. It's a terrible way to lose, really. Stage 4 Kulv Taroth is where you're most likely going to die to one of her moves. Her moveset is now very fast and dangerous, and now you get debris that falls off of the ceiling and hits you for relatively high damage actually. In this stage, you're definitely going to want to consider the Temporal Mantle and the Fireproof Mantle. Make sure you've maxed out your health bar with the max potion. I would say the biggest risk to failing stage 4 is not actually running out of time, but having your team run out of lives. You have two objectives in stage 4, break her tail and break her horns. Now, as I said before in the diagram, if you've already broken her tail once in the previous run, you don't have to break it again. 
But if you started a brand new siege, right, you're on a new siege, a new reward cycle, then yes, you do need to break the tail in order to max out your rewards. So let's say uh, Pursuit 1. You, all you did was gather tracks, and you managed to get the Pursuit up to Pursuit 4 as a session of 16 people. Then you start in Pursuit 4. This time you want to break the horns, right? Well, you haven't broken the tail once, which means when you get Kul Taroth down to stage 4 of the fight, you're going to have to break her tail and her horns, okay? So it's, it's difficult, but you're going to have to do it if you want all of the rewards. Notice for breaking the tail that you don't need to be using any particular kind of damage, right? It all works. Everything contributes to the tail break. So if you have slice ammo versus, let's say, your highest damaging ammo, don't worry about the slice, just go for whatever your highest damaging ammo is. It's also worth noting that the tail has a pretty large hitbox, so you don't have to aim only for the tip of the tail, just damage it wherever you can. A great time to get some tail damage in is any time Kulftaroth stands up on her hind legs to use one of her fire attacks. That means you don't have to focus on the tail exclusively, you can try to focus on it with the opportune moments, like maybe when she turns around to face one of your teammates. I would also say if the tail hasn't broken after a good amount of time has passed, you really do need to stop what you're doing and begin to focus the tail because you don't want to accidentally break her horns and then end the run before the tail is broken. It's in stage 4 that you want to make sure you crack out all of your crowd controls. Ideally, somebody with a bow gun or a bow will be able to do this for you, so it helps to recognize who has which ailments. It's also important to remember the only damage that matters is damage you've dealt to her horns. Okay, so uh, assuming you've already broken the tail, you don't need to aim for any other part of her body, only aim for her horns. You might wonder if you should use an ailment weapon like paralysis dual blades, and my answer to that is generally no. Her threshold for a second proc of paralysis is so high that you will not trigger a second paralysis. You want to use whatever version of your weapon is going to deal optimal damage to her horns. That means for dual blades, you'll be using ice dual blades. For slower weapons like a greatsword, hammer, hunting horn, you're going to build for raw, elementless damage. Now, if no one has brought a bow gun or a bow that has a sleep ailment on it, that might be the one exception. Sleep is the most valuable ailment in stage 4 to inflict damage on Kul Tarot's horns, because she goes into a lengthy falling asleep animation that you can continue to punish, by the way, and then when she's actually asleep, you can set up 8 barrel bombs on her, which is exactly what everyone must do. Okay, so no matter what, you better have two mega barrel bombs just waiting for Kulv Taroth when she goes to sleep in stage four. This is very important. It's like the difference between winning easily and struggling. Some weapons, like the hammer, are especially adept at using the pillar in the center of the room. That's because with the hammer, you don't even have to sheet the weapon. You just run toward the wall, and you're going to run up the wall. Not only does the pillar work as a form of cover for you to run behind, but you can also run up it and try to land an aerial attack on Kulv Taroth until you get a mount. Mounting Kulv Taroth is highly recommended, since it's going to lead to a knockdown where everyone can gang up on her horns. When someone mounts Kulv Taroth, Another trick you can use is you can try to set up barrel bombs down at either of the pillars, well, these are also walls that you can run up, and they're on the side of the room, and she'll actually run into these with her horns. She'll actually ram them, and the barrels will explode. Another tip is that some weapons are going to be able to give the team a KO knockdown. In particular, that would be hammers, hunting horns, uh, bows that are using their arc shot, and bow guns that are using sticky ammo. If you see a hammer user begin his big bang combo on Kulv Taroth while she's immobilized, for the love of god do not interrupt him with your own relatively lower damage attacks. Big bang is the hammer's highest DPS move, it's very likely that he's about to deal a lot more damage than you. But it requires not being interrupted for a long time. So if you're a longsword user or you're a dual blades user, if you just pick a better position to spam your own attack around Kulv Taroth's head, you can both get your damage output up, and he's going to help build up stun for another KO knockdown. A last tip for stage 4 is that, similar to all the other stages in the Kulv Taroth fight, Barrel bombs continue to be the highest form of damage that you can do. That's why putting Kulv Taroth to sleep was so important, right? And that also means when she becomes immobilized, it's not a bad idea to simply use barrel bombs on her head. However, please note that you want to make sure 
to the best of your ability that you set these Mega Barrel Bombs down in a way that doesn't simply blast all of your teammates away from her head, because if you knock them away, you're actually going to lower your damage output because now your teammates aren't attacking anymore. So if you're going to use Barrel Bombs every time Kulv Taroth gets immobilized, that's not a bad idea because they do so much damage. But once again, you need to be very carefully picking where you set these Barrel Bombs down at so that you just clip her horns and not your teammates. If you and your team did enough damage to the horns, they pop off and the siege is over. You can then go and return to collect your rewards. Remember, you get rainbow rewards based on meeting certain objectives. Uh, the first one would be, you didn't wipe out and fail the first run against Kulv Taroth in a new siege, right? That would be the, uh, uh, returning counts as well. If you return from the quest, that's a fail as well. The next one would be, you reached reward level 17, and you enraged Kulv Taroth in stage 4 by breaking all parts of her mantle at least once. And finally, there's a condition that has a question mark next to it that nobody really is sure how to trigger. I'm guessing it has to do something with, I don't know, maybe nobody failing any of the quests? Or maybe it's something crazy like nobody died ever? I, I have no idea. I all I know is that I've seen it twice and it gives out two more rainbow rewards, which brings your total incandescent relics up to eight, which is a ton. But I see it so rarely, I'm guessing it has to do with something that involves the entire session. Here's a nice tip for managing your inventory, by the way. When you're collecting your rainbow rewards and all of your rewards, you can actually see if you already own the reward that you've earned by looking at the little chest icon. If you do already own it, you might as well sell that weapon right from the reward screen to save yourself some time. Okay, so we're done talking about stages 2, 3, and 4. Let's do a quick review. Number 1. Stage 2 is a DPS part break stage where you don't want to use any ailments, although you might build up some KO and some mount damage. Just be careful not to actually KO Kulv Taroth and not to actually mount her. Number 2. In stage 3, uh, there are three boulders that you need to drop and land on top of Kulv Taroth. If you aren't luring her under these boulders, then you're doing a bad job. Also, it's in this stage that you better be sure to finish breaking all of her parts at least once. And then number 3, before stage 4, you want to travel back to camp and swap out your stage 4 build. And then when you return to fighter, be sure to use all of your saved up ailments and be sure to break the tail as well in order to maximize your rewards. Also be careful, this is where you're probably going to die. That's the full explanation of the Kulv Taroth siege fight. At this point in the guide, we move over to talking about the most effective builds, followed by a review of her moveset. Both of those are pretty important, especially the moveset. Do not skip the moveset. There's a simple rule for building in stages 1, 2, and 3. The rule is that you should always bring part breaker. Okay, so you could do that with a part breaker charm combined with the Oregon coil, or alternatively the Oregon chest combined with the Oregon coil, or if you're lucky like me, just use three part breaker decorations. I would say your second highest priority is to build three levels of bombardier. You could do this really efficiently using the Zora Magdaros coil, uh, it gives you two levels of bombardier. Of course, if you bring that, it means you're not going to be able to use the Oregon coil, and just note that the part breaker skill gets build priority over the bombardier skill. So if it's a case that you need the Oregon coil, go ahead and build it. For building damage against Kulv Taroth is, you know, it takes a little bit of practice, it takes a little of experiment, but basically what we know about her is that she gets really good hit zones for elemental damage. So for your weapon class that you main, most of the time you're going to be picking out your best thunder damage. However, for weapons that are kind of slower, that would include hammers, great swords, hunting horns, you're not going to do that. You're not going to worry about thunder damage. You're really just going to build the best raw damage version. Also, with the gun lances, I would say use wide shelling. So if you can get wide shelling 4, that would be terrific. In fact, Kulv Taroth herself drops a rarity 6 wide shelling gun lance. And that means it's 1. It's very easy to obtain. She's going to drop it pretty quickly. And 2. Wide shelling 4 means it's going to do just as much shelling damage as any other wide shelling 4 gun lance in the game. Wide shelling is extremely good for new players, in my opinion, so uh, maybe I'll make a separate video about that in the future. So, fast weapons, lightning damage. Slow weapons, raw damage, 
gun lances, I would go wide four. Now, if you're looking for the number one easiest weapon to bring against Kovtaroth for the early stages, is probably the Styx Light Bowgun, followed by the Kiara Thunder Bowgun. Uh, all you gotta do is build for thunder ammo, and then you just keep moving and shooting her. You're really gonna do heavy damage because uh, the nature of elemental ammo types. So elemental ammo, it pierces through the monster uh, to do multiple procs of damage as it's traveling, and Kovtaroth has a very large body for this. So for she gets very good thunder hit zones, right? And then at the same time, she has a nice long body. You just end up doing tons and tons of damage with your thunder ammo. I'll go ahead and show you two versions of the Styx Light Bogan build, an optimized build. And a cheap build. I'd also like to mention that the Kiar Thunder, once again, is totally viable. They're about even. Also, I would say, in terms of heavy bowguns, since I love heavy bowguns, my new favorite Kul Roth heavy bowgun build is definitely the Griffin Blazooka for Wyvern Snipe. Next, we have to think about how to build for Stage 4 Kul Roth with the Styx Light Bowgun. As long as you brought enough slice ammo and slice berries to craft more slice ammo, you can actually move right into stage 4 and just start attacking Kovtaroth. Be sure though you brought some sticky as well, so you can contribute to causing a KO knockdown and if you run out of slice ammo, you can just craft some sticky ammo. With the stick slight bowgun, it will also be your job to put Kovtaroth to sleep for everyone. If you brought the Kyar Thunder light bowgun, then you're going to be the one who uses paralysis. Another really strong build for fighting Kovtaroth in stage 4, this is a really good one, is the Legiana bow. Because it comes with sleep, you can add paralysis coating in the build, and finally you can use the bow's arc shot to build KO damage, so you're actually getting all three of the ailments. Finally, I would say a sticky setup on the Magna Gameta should be considered, since that comes with sleep ammo, paralysis ammo, and then you can also use your sticky ammo level 3 for possibly 2 KO knockdowns. I, I might make a, a separate video just for this, because it's such an important topic. All three of these weapons are extremely useful for crowd controlling Kul Tarath. Now if you aren't using a bow gun or bow in stage 4, your primary role is to deal high damage. That means bringing your best ice weapon, or once again, if you're using a slow weapon like the hammer or the greatsword, you just build for raw. You're still able to help out by doing things like mounting the monster, or if you have a blunt weapon, the hammer, building up stun. Finally, let's say that you're terribly new to the game and none of your weapons are that good. I would say you should build up as much defense as you can and consider using something like a wide shelling gun lance, which is always going to deal the same amount of damage with this shelling because shelling is an explosive damage type, meaning it ignores hit zones. Also, you should definitely be maxing bombardier and using mega barrel bombs in stage 4. In terms of defense, the first thing I would build is health boost, then fire resistance, very important. Fire resistance is useful because Arch-Tempered Kul Tarath, I found that her deadliest moves are all the fire damage moves. Lastly, I would build Divine Blessing. I also want to mention at this point that if you're using a shield weapon, you have to have the guard skill if you want to be able to block the lava on the floor. And then you're also going to need at least three levels of guard in order to be able to stand in it and guard it over and over again without running out of stamina and quickly dying. It's very easy to die to Kul Tarath's lava. So unless you're ready for it, which means like your stamina bar is maxed out, I probably recommend just trying to detect it and then avoid it altogether. Even the chip damage is pretty heavy. Once again, I'm going to be mentioning the Fire Mantle at this point since I think it's more valuable than the Rocksteady Mantle in terms of defense. Only a few builds are able to take Health Boost, Fire Resist, and Protection and still be able to max out on good damage. Gunlance Shelling builds happen to be one of those few setups. Another one would be that Griffin Blazooka setup for Wyvern Snipe. Alright, so now that I've talked about some of the overall best builds for fighting Kul Tarath, the last part of this guide is to talk about Arch-Tempered Kul Tarath's moveset. Number 1. In Stage 1, Kul Tarath barely attacks at all, and it's her easy physical attack, so we're really not going to worry about those. Number 2. In Stages 2 and 3, Kul Tarath uses a digging attack to reset her mantle. If you get too close to this, it will actually hurt you for very high damage. I've been one-shot by this move, so in general, just don't get too close. Number 3. Another stage 2 and 3 attack 
Kovtaroth has a death roll, kind of like an alligator. Most people recognize this move because it has a unique windup and so much range, but it's also very slow. You can sheath your weapon and use a dive evade to avoid it pretty easily. There's also a small area underneath her body during the roll that you can actually run to and it will just barely miss you if you stand right in the and it will just barely miss you if you stand in just the right spot. But I don't recommend doing this, it's too risky. I try to stay near her head when she's winding the depth roll up, and then I run to my left to avoid the entire attack. This is fairly easy to do if she's targeting you, but if she's targeting a teammate, you might not be in the right position. Number 4. The last exclusive attack to stage 2 and 3 is a simple lava attack that will pull around her body. This move deals very high tick damage and you do not want to be caught in it. It will also cause eruptions in stage 3. These are exactly what they sound like and you have to be careful to avoid them. Next we move on to some attacks that are in stage 2, 3, and 4. First of all, she has her hot beam. The hot beam gets aimed directly at the player and will one shot most builds. Even if she wasn't aiming at you, this beam can land and cause one shot, so everyone needs to be watching for this all the time. She will actually take two shots any time she try She will actually take two shots any time she, she will actually take two shots any time she tries to aim the hot beam, but it's fairly easy to strafe away from and punish. Just try not to pull the beam into one of your teammates. Number six, Kovtaroth has a very punishable body slam. You will see her wind this slow move up and then come crashing down with her arms on each side. It's perfect for damaging her horns in stage 4. Number 7. She also has a lunging attack where she slams into the player. This is a bit faster than the body slam, also you get a bit less time to punish it, but it's still pretty easy to avoid. Number 8. Kovtaroth also has an arm and tail swipe. These are separate moves. She simply takes her arm or her tail and she swings it at the player. Now the arm swipe can be gotten away from by simply outspacing it, but the tail has so much reach that you really should just consider dive evading it, or you at least need to really start moving to get outside of the reach of this move. I've been one shot by the tail swipe in stage 2 before, so you should really be taking it seriously. Number 9. Finally, let's examine the stage 4 attacks that are really going to give you a headache. Starting us out, she uses a lava beam attack to begin her enragement. The lava pool has a limited range around her feet, but she also sweeps her beam to the side in this attack and puts down new lava as the beam passes by. You can get in front of her and back away from it, and this is a pretty safe position, or you can get behind her near her tail, which is what I recommend. This enragement causes the whole room to turn a shade of red, and now debris will fall from the ceiling and hit the player for high damage. You get a long warning before the debris falls, you can kind of see it dripping, but even though the debris is highly telegraphed, you can still accidentally roll into a piece of debris that has already started falling, so it's definitely something you should be building against so that it doesn't easily two-shot you. Number 10. Kovtaroth has a few deadly fire attacks for stage 4. One that kills me all the time is when she stands on her hind legs and then fires down an enormous strip of lava that pretty much travels all the way across the arena. If you want to avoid it, you need to go far enough to the left or to the right of the attack before it reaches you. The lava does heavy ticks of damage, especially if you have bad fire resistance. Number 11. A new fire attack Kovtaroth received when she became Arch Tempered is a modified version of the Valhazak or Zenajiva beam. It's a beam that sweeps from side to side in a large cone. Basically, Kovtaroth's version of it has less range, however, it leaves pools of lava behind at the end of the beam. If you get stuck in one of those lava pools, you will die extremely fast. The nice thing is that you can actually outspace this beam, unlike the other versions of it from the other monsters. Number 12. With the super dangerous stage 4 fire attacks out of the way, Kovtaroth also has a number of stage 4 dangerous physical attacks as well. Anything Kov does in stage 4 is going to hurt really bad, so just try your best not to get killed in general. Of the moves we haven't listed for stage 4 yet, she has a ramming attack where she slams her head down and then charges toward you. At the end of it she kind of does a turn. This move typically one shots me, so run to the left or right as soon as she begins charging it up. Number 13, Arch Tempered Kovtaroth received a new arm slam where she will wind up and when she punches her arm down, a burst of gold will rise up from the location of her attack. This was copied over from the Nergigante moveset. 
I would say that it doesn't have much range, so it's pretty easy to avoid, but it does do a lot of damage if you happen to get hit by it, and it can easily break your guard if you're trying to block it, even with guard skill on your build. She also uses headbutt in a really strange way where she slams her head into the ground and then she actually kind of backs up while thrashing. It's attempting to punish this move with your melee attacks but don't risk it because her head is one large attack during this move. Finally there's this pretty uncommon attack Kulftaroth uses where she basically falls on her side as if she wanted to fall on top of you. This move is easy to punish as long as you aren't underneath her when she lands it. And that's my full cover of the Kulv Taroth moveset. If I missed a move, just say so in the comment section, but I believe I got all the big ones. All right, and that's the end of the guide. Let me know in the comment section if you watched the entire video. I'm always curious about that because I worked really hard on it. Be sure to share the video so that people learn about the Pursuit 1 Stage 1 farming method. It's just better all around. We've been testing it in the live streams. It's just a superior way to play. And then finally, I want to thank Rathius for supporting the channel on Patreon, and I want to thank all of you for watching. I'll see you guys next time.